I fish, I hunt, and always will. Broadcasting from the Prairie Sportsman Studios. Presented by OnX. Know where you stand with OnX. <clears throat> We're not just a radio show anymore. Heck yeah. This is Sporting Journal Radio. Welcome to the show. I'm Brett Amundsen. Thanks for tuning in on this station right here by downloading the podcast or uh, by watching this on YouTube. Thank you very much. We're not just a radio show anymore. In fact, we've got a lot of really cool content that we're going to bring you uh, this year. We've got a brand new YouTube channel to tell you about, and uh, we'll tell you why we're doing all this stuff, too. It's not just to sit around and uh, drink beer and eat pizza like we're doing right now. I mean, I mean that's definitely part of it. Kind of enjoy that part of it. But we've actually got some really, uh, really big reasons for why we do what we do, and we'll talk about that coming up in just a little bit. That's Dan Amundsen right over there. Dan, how are you doing? Hey, doing great. And David Eckhart joining us over there. Doing good. And his Hi, new- David. Nobody <laughs> asked, actually, how you were doing. <laughs> yeah, I am doing good. <laughs> David in his new corner. Yeah. We've got a new spot. Can we go a wide shot on him over there? Maybe. You're asking a lot of me here. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. Oh, look, well, yeah, you can see part of the part of the live target behind him. And there's actually, he's surrounded by mounts over there in the corner. Yeah, it's no, kind it's of a cool over. spot. We can't really tell when you're watching this, but that's right. Just take our word for it, I guess. <laughs> All right. Uh, we're going to talk uh, ice fishing this week. We'll talk about, I know you guys have been out chasing uh, panfish a little bit. We'll talk about how, how you did doing that. Also, Scott Mockentune is doing a DNR webinar for lake trout ice fishing, and we're, we're, we love lake trout around here. So we're going to talk to Scott this week. He's going to be joining us here on the show to talk about tips for ice fishing for those big fire feisty lake trout in northern Minnesota. Joe Henry will be back. We'll get an uh, ice fishing report from Lake of the Woods as well. And uh, we got all kinds of stuff. Dan, I'm going to let you talk because I want to eat some pizza. Who are our sponsors this week? Our sponsors this week are, I think it's this video, On X. Know where you stand with On X. Lake of the Woods Tourism. Lake of the Woods is the walleye capital. Plan a trip for this winter at lakeofthewoodsmn.com. Live target match the hatch at livetargetlures.com. Runner up in F Tex. Haybell Heights Campground Resort on Devil's Lake. Book a trip to Devil's Lake. Learn more at haybellheights.com. Al Claire Audio. Save your hearing in the field with Al Claire. Learn more at Al Claire Outdoors.com. Riverbend Resort. I forgot to write anything for Riverbend. We love Riverbend. If you're booking a trip to Lake of the Woods, consider Riverbend Resort at riverbendresort.com. Ottertail Lakes Country. Find your inner otter at ottertaillakescountry.com. And Prairie Sportsman, the new season starts in January. Watch episodes anytime in the meantime at for the Prairie Sportsman YouTube channel. And we are going to be making appearance at the Minnesota Deer Classic this year, Deer and Turkey Classic. It's going to be at Canterbury Park in Shakopee. That is uh, March 10th, 11th, and 12th, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And uh, we'll be there. Uh, I know I'll be there. Maybe Dan, maybe David. We'll be there hanging out from 10 to noon at the outdoor news booth right inside the door there next to Shields. You can come by and say hi. We'll probably have some free stuff to give you. So stop out and see us at the Minnesota Deer and Turkey Classic Canterbury. Go to mndeerclassic.com for more details. Uh, David, did you bring us any eggs, by the way? I did not. I far- I forgot. I should have. Yeah, my bad. We talked about it last week, didn't we? We did, Ew, yeah. David. That's my new button. <laughs> what, what was that? What, what did that? How'd that go? Ew, David. You, David, from uh, Shift you can't, Creek. Ah, you can't say that. <laughs> uh, I got you. I'm not sure we can say the name of the show. Yeah, even. probably not. That's my point. It's oh, S, yeah. S Creek on the radio. Gotcha. Yeah. Podcast, you could say it. I don't care. <laughs> I, I'm i shocked at what eggs are going for right now. Yeah, they have blown up. This is your first year with chickens, right? Yes. How is it going? It's going good. Yeah, they've been producing a lot of eggs for the amount. We have 15 chickens and we're getting nine to 13 every day. Oh, really? Every day? <laughs> every day. That's pretty common. Is that kind of an average? Um, normally they slow down in the winter, but yeah, it's been, they've been doing really good. But you got, I mean, it's probably like summer in that coop that you built. Them. It's pretty warm in there. Yeah. It's usually 20 to 30 degrees warmer than it is outside. So the other day it was 45 degrees in there. Yeah. Like at, like anything you built, David, you're pretty handy for our, our audience. For those that don't know, David's pretty handy, knows how to build stuff. You went to school to be a carpenter, right? Yep. That's what you went to school for. You, you do some welding. You do a lot of, you like to build your own stuff. And you I like to overbuild. You, build, you overbuild it. Yeah. <laughs> if, it's worth, if it's worth building, you might as well overbuild it. There's HD and then there's HDD, which stands for David <laughs> at the end of it. Uh, what? How did you, how long did it take you to build that? Tell me about the coop a little bit. Um, it's a 10 by 12 coop. 
I built it all from scratch and overbuilt it and it took way longer than I told Lindsay it'd take, you know, three weeks, which maybe it would have if I'd have stuck to it every day, but between work and everything else going on in life, it it took about three months to build. <laughs> but it's all done now and it's all heated and insulated and has power and yeah, there's some spoiled chickens. So when Lindsay gets mad at you, is that where you go? Because it sounds like a man kid. I like could, you could put yeah. a TV in there. Yeah, I, I said if we ever don't have chickens, I'm gonna have a really nice tool shed <laughs> or hideout. <laughs> That's awesome. I've thought about wanting to do chickens. Uh, I was just talking to somebody else about chickens. Oh, some of my neighbors had some chickens. They don't right now, but I was talking to them about it. And my problem is, I, I feel like I'm never home enough. Right. You know, I'd come home and they'd be, you know, they'd be all dead. Yeah, you know, like a Kyle would get them or something. Yeah. And, but um, that'd be kind of fun, I think. So next week, bring us some eggs. I will. All right. Um, but yeah, we're always taking trips. Uh, in fact, we, we went to Alaska, Kodiak Island in December. You can see the trailer now. We've got a brand new YouTube channel we're very excited about here called Fish Hunt Forever. So the trailer for the North American waterfowl film Kodiak is out now. Check it out on the new Fish Hunt Forever YouTube channel. Now, I want to explain what that is a little bit. And we've kind of had a mantra here, guys, over the last year about I fish, I hunt, and always will. And what that means is we want our, our fishing and hunting traditions to never end. We want to continue forever. We want to pass them down to future generations. I feel like fishing and hunting in particular and, you know, the, the tools we use in hunting guns, so forth, are constantly under attack. So we want to preserve these, our outdoor heritage, these traditions of hunting and fishing forever. So that's, that's what we're trying to do. I mean, we like to have fun on this show, but... We also want to, you know, celebrate the outdoors in a way that uh, gives people a reason to go out and try it or a reason to go back and try it again or or whatever, just to keep doing it so that we preserve these these traditions. We want people to know why we enjoy it so much. So we came up with this fish hunt forever. So, right. I fish, I hunt, always will fish hunt forever. It's a YouTube channel where all of our films and adventure vlogs will be. We've been kind of putting them up on the sporting journal radio channel, but we're going to separate those now. So if you're watching this on our YouTube channel, we'll keep bringing you this show on this channel, but now like our trip videos, will go on fish hunt forever. We're going to be we're going to be coming up with ways to donate to conservation. We're going to find ways to preserve the outdoors heritage and continue to go out and find some of those unique stories in the outdoors and uh, travel around hunting and fishing and, and showing you ways that you can do it, showing you ways that you can do it better and more. So subscribe to the channel Fish Hunt Forever and right now you can watch that new trailer for the Kodiak video. Who caught that big walleye? Uh, I think that, that looks like my hands. I'm pretty sure. Well, I know you'd never let me get a camera that close to the water. So <laughs> no, that was yours, Dan. Uh, I'm guessing that was a Tobin Lake walleye. Probably. I love that lake. And I took that picture. And we got a trip planned to Tobin Lake coming up this winter. I'm excited to ice fish it. I've I haven't uh, I've only open water fished up. There. I forgot about that trip. That'll be a fun one. Who yeah. wants to go? Let's go. Let's go. David, much, you want to go? How much ice does Northern Saskatchewan get? Uh, Thirteen feet. <laughs> so I know you just bought a new auger. Did yeah, you get did, did you get the Canada extension? I did not get 18 <laughs> extensions for that. Yeah, it's, it's called the Canada extension. Now, I just talked to uh, Trevor Montgomery about that the other day, and I can't remember what he said. They had 30 inches or something like Gosh. that. Um, but, yeah, they get a, I mean, they definitely get a fair amount. Say and, by March when we go, it's going to be like 60 inches. Yeah. That's so well, much they, they might get so much snow, though. It might insulate it. Yeah, they could. So, who knows? But we'll find out. At least we won't die. Right. And we'll catch big fish, but we're going to lose big fish at the hole. Not that any ice is safe, but... Right. Yeah, we should reiterate There's a that. lot safer, yeah. more ice than that far north. I'd feel okay driving your truck out there. Yeah. <laughs> you got the big truck. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Not to... the Colorado. That's why you get a Colorado. You can drive it anywhere. <laughs> she floats. <laughs> it's like a three-wheeler. It's the three-wheeler <laughs> trucks. <laughs> well, we're going to go up and see our friends, uh, Trevor Montgomery and Barry Prawl from Taz and Lake Lodge and also Trails End Outfitters. Barry's got a lodge on Tobin Lake, trailsendoutfitters.com. If you want to go up there and uh, stay, he's got some ice fishing rentals. So we're going to go fish out of some of his rentals. And then uh, Trevor's been chasing Burbit up there and uh Pike, Ooh. like he's been catching, you know, that I, I did. I always heard of Tobin Lake for walleyes, right? Big walleyes, 15 pounders. And then we went there and fished and we were catching like mid 30 inch pike, right? And you think of a 40 inch as a trophy, but these 35 inch pike on Tobin, there's so much forage in there for them. They're, they're, it's like they're, it's like they're next to a, uh, 
power, nuclear power plant or something. They're just <laughs> fat. So they're a lot of fun. So Trevor's been catching them through the ice up there. So we're looking forward to getting up there. He's been using that. some of our lures, some live targets up there, I think, too. He has been catching them on live target. He sent us a picture, actually. I don't know if I sent it to you, but he sent us a picture of a big pike with... Uh, um, the Erratic Shiner, I the think, erratic wasn't shiner. it? Yeah, he loves that thing up there. So check it out, LiveTargetLures.com. That's right. So lots of trip. I think we might go to Niagara Falls. Heck yeah. Say. Thanks to Glow. Join Thanks. a Glow. You can go to cool trips like Niagara Falls. Who knew you could catch walleyes and muskies at Niagara Falls? And steelhead, steelhead and brown yeah. trout. Yeah. Wow. We're we can ice fish. We might ice fish and open water fish and catch all sorts of things. Lake Erie and Lake Ontario right there. <laughs> and I suppose there's a big waterfall we should go see. Yeah, there's that. <laughs> you know, that's the thing. Like a Glow has been a great organization for us. If you're an outdoor content creator, whether you're a writer, photographer, TV, radio host, whatever, Think about Association of Great Lakes Outdoor Riders. It's taken us to places like we went to Branson for our conference last year. And I'm like, Branson, I don't, you know, I don't want to go sit in a theater with, you know, watch this, you know, people square dance or whatever. That, like, like, that's the impression I got in my my brain when I got there. I was like, like, holy crap, this place is, is pretty cool. And the, the bass fishing, obviously, you got Table Rock there and uh, uh, some of the some of the other lakes. I mean, it's, it's pretty legendary place. And then we heard about Niagara Falls and I was like, well, I don't want to really go look at a waterfall. And then I started to learn about fishing Lake Erie and Lake Ontario and all these tributaries and all this, all these fishing opportunities out there. So it's going to be pretty fun. And we're going to film that for you and put it on the fish hunt forever YouTube channel. Subscribe to it uh, today. All right. We got a lot to talk about, including we should talk about this. The DNR put out a thing about uh, snowmobile safety tips, like the snow. And then we talked about having some bird hunting trips lined up and now we have yeah. no bird hunting trips lined up anymore <laughs> yeah that's certain reasons but well yeah a lot do you, of it, i don't know where you're going with this well i was going to say a lot of it has to do with the snow in south dakota we we're going to go oh, pheasant yeah. in south dakota and the snow is just too much so now i'm going to think about fishing and getting my snowmobile fired up and the dnr obviously a lot of people are uh, doing it i've seen a lot of groomed snowmobile trails out and the dnr is putting out some safety tips and we want to give you not the safety tips we want to tell you things that have gone wrong on a snowmobile and david's got a couple of stories that i want you to share on the i do have today. a couple good ones yeah uh, the first one, I broke the windshield off of my snowmobile driving in. It was a really warm February. What? And this is all about, these two stories are about two weeks apart. But the first one, we shot a coyote right by my yard and there was so much snow. We didn't want to walk out. I was like, I'll just go grab my snowmobile. So I'm standing up, driving, looking for this coyote out in the snow. And I hit a soft spot that just stopped me cold. And I was only going... 10, 15 miles an hour <clears throat> It stopped the snowmobile cold. And I hit the windshield with my chest as I did a front flip over, <laughs> over the front of the snowmobile and yeah, shattered the windshield. And I landed in front of the ski and just was wondering what in the world just happened. <laughs> so that's the first one. And then two I, weeks. I like how you, before the show, we were talking about it. You're like, well, this one time I broke my windshield off with my chest. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, no, it was, it was, I didn't know what happened. It, it was so it happened so fast that I was just dumbfounded. And then the second one that two weeks later, that warm February, a bunch of snow on the lake had melted and then refroze. So it was glare ice with frozen snow drifts protruding out of the slush or water. And I wasn't going very fast and I was on glare ice and I tapped the brake and snowmobile started to come sideways and I hit one of those drifts. And it threw me off and I landed on my head and the snowmobile rolled one time and broke the kill switch off and it died right there. Landed, Thankfully, landed back on the skis, but I wasn't wearing a helmet, which was dumb. I was just going to check a landing to see if it was accessible with vehicles, you know, just a quick trip. And those are the ones that always end up to bite you, but I should have had a helmet on and yeah, hit my head pretty bad and got my, somehow got the snowmobile started again and went about two miles an hour all the way back <laughs> to the landing I came out of. Well, that's what I was going to ask you about. I mean, if you broke the kill switch off, how did you get it started again? I had my pliers on me, oh. so I was able to pop the switch back up. But So there's a tip for you. Always bring pliers with you. Always have a pliers. Definitely always wear a helmet. Smith's Consumer Products <laughs> there, pliers. There you go. Shameless plug. <laughs> what else do you try to bring with you when you go snowmobiling? Warm gloves. Yeah, definitely warm gloves. It's been a long time. That was kind of the last year I snowmobiled, but yeah, I always try to have warm gloves and 
extra goggles if you don't have a full face. Um, yeah, just try and stay as warm as possible to stay out as long as you can. So did you have your phone with you that first time? Was the snowmobile operational? Were you able to um, drive it? I, I'm pretty sure I did have my phone, but I was able to get it started. Oh, so, you were both times? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, the first time I was a quarter mile from my house. I couldn't oh, walk to my house. But <laughs> that helps. Yeah. So <clears throat> there's your tip of the day from Sporting Journal Radio. If you break down in your snowmobile, do it really close to your house. <laughs> right. <laughs> just do laps when you ride. Just do laps around, yeah. your, around your house. All right. Uh, snowmobiling. Have you taken any trips to do any snowmobiling? Um, a long time ago. Yeah. We went up around the Park Rapids area. There's a lot of trails and stuff up there. and That was a lot of fun riding. Just trail riding not necessarily out boondocking in the powder but sure well next time you should think about doing lake of the woods because i hear there's a few trails up at lake of the woods that maybe joe henry can tell us about from lake of the woods tourism joe how you doing there's a lot of trails up there you guys know that firsthand you do absolutely <laughs> Yeah, and that, including that one got rip, rips right up to the northwest angle i mean i that's got to be one of the more unique trails, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to say that you can't ride through some big hills and some cool trees and other parts of the state, but being being able to go 40 miles across Lake of the Woods has got to be a pretty unique trail in Minnesota. Oh, man. Well, you know, and it's, it's staked and groomed, too. That's the thing. You know, and you know, some people use it for recreation. Some people use it because it allows them to go to fishing spots on Lake of the Woods that aren't hit. Some of the structured spots and stuff, snowmobile collapsible. And then some people use it as a transportation route to get up to the northwest angle. So it, it, it really is kind of a unique trail. And, you know, that, that trail, they got one that goes from Wheeler's Point up that hugs the, the eastern boundary with Canada straight north. And they have another one that goes out of the, the western part over by, uh, you know, Rocky Point and in, uh, in World in that area. And that goes straight up as well to uh, get to the northwest angle. So it is very interesting. You know, you get your 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 fun snowmobiling in the woods and in different parts of the lake and and that sort of thing but then you got your snowmobiling that's more of a almost like a transportation route that's what it's mm -hmm. used for more than anything and garden island's oh. got a little warming house oh yeah how's, how's that pizza definitely getting pizza right <laughs> now pizza pretty good sorry she's not on it right you, you probably used to be talking a little longer you know i will tell you this i heard david i heard david uh talking about his his faux pas the snowmobile and you know uh um Brett McComas of Target Walleye, you know, he oh, yeah. had a, a full paw last year where he got thrown off his stone bill hitting just a place where a fish house was. And and I got to tell you, my nephew, uh, my nephew, Johnny, uh, he was on a snowmobile going across Lake Minnetonka after having dinner at one of the restaurants. And he was going across Lake Minnetonka and hit a an ice berm or a, something he didn't see. It flew him off and he landed on his back and broke a bunch of ribs. He couldn't move. Oh, boy. So he... Uh, he said it was, uh, he had an iPhone with, he said, Siri, call 911. He called 911, was on with them for about five seconds, and the battery died. Oh, no. Well, that was <laughs> enough for the sheriff's department to ping his location, and uh, he could hear a helicopter flying. Here come to find out that a helicopter had uh, infrared, you know, um, lo looking for somebody on the ice. They found him, and then, you know, uh, a side-by-side -side with tracks uh, from the sheriff's department, came out to retrieve him and wow. uh, but he was very 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 fortunate i mean that could have been if his phone wouldn't have had that much juice and if he would have had the insight to say hey siri call 911 you know who knows it was a very cold night he had broken ribs he was on his back he couldn't move mm, man so always try to bring your bring keep your phone charged mm -hmm. as much as you can ride with a buddy ride with a buddy yeah, yeah ride with a sure. buddy take it slow um and just yeah just be careful things happen though you know like you know, hit, hitting the little ridges where ice fish houses used to be. They come up on you so fast when you're snowmobiling, you know. And when you're snowmobiling on these sleds nowadays, going 50 seems like it's nothing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I, I remember I, I emceed a fishing tournament one time, uh, I think in Cumberland, Wisconsin. I was emceeing this fishing tournament, ice fishing tournament. And one of the local power sports dealers gave us a couple snowmobiles to use and there were trails off the lake that kind of bounced around through the woods so we had the snowmobiles all weekend and uh so me and the other guy that were, they were doing the emceeing were like hey we should let's go trail riding a little bit so we ripped across the lake and we're like i wonder what these things do 
no helmets or anything. <laughs> and I look down, I'm doing 100 miles an hour. And I'm like, oh, oh, next year, we got much sn- much smaller snowmobiles given to us. <laughs> <laughs> I think they saw us why. going across the lake and said, that's a bad idea. So uh, always wear a helmet. And, you know, you hear horror stories of people going across the lake uh, in the dark, you know, and... Um, you know, hitting obstacles, hitting fish houses and things like that. So you got to be real, real careful. Joe, that story about the helicopter, was that helicopter, did that just happen to be out there or did they send that helicopter looking oh, for Oh, no, him? no, they, they sent it. They oh, sent they it. So that when, when he called, you know, when he called 911 on his phone via voice and he had he had uh, 911 on there just for a few seconds before the, the phone died of juice, um, that was enough for them to say, okay, we got a guy on the ice that's in trouble and his phone just died. So they can, you know, they, they know where the location is based on that, that call. And uh, and then they put the helicopter up in the air purposely with that infrared. And, you know, the infrared, for people that don't know, they, they even use it in the hunting industry. In some states, it's legal. But you can you can see things that are warm versus the cold, right? That's that's what you're looking for. And certainly they, they spotted his body laying out there, and then they, they knew where to dispatch the, the side-by-side. Sure. All right, Joe, we got to take a quick break, but I want to get a fishing report from Lake of the Woods. So we'll have more with Joe Henry when we come back. It's ice fishing season and time to plan your trip to Riverbend Resort on Lake of the Woods. Stay at the Lakeside Resort along the Rainy River in one of their new cabins and enjoy delicious meals and hot or cold beverages in the Miles Lab Barn Grill. Or stay in one of their comfortable sleeper houses on the ice, complete with a TV, stove, and lots of walleyes right beneath your feet. You also have the option of staying at their motel, the Walleye Inn, located in Bidet. Book your ice fishing trip to famous Lake of the Woods today at riverbendresort.com. That's riverbendresort.com. 852 million acres of public land, 147 million private properties, all in the palm of your hand. The number one hunting GPS app just got better. With hundreds of custom map layers, 3D and topographic maps, you can easily scout on the road or at home before you go. And now you can get important weather details, CWD detection, and even know what crops have been planted where. Get the most trusted hunting GPS app ever made. Onyx, know where you stand with Onyx. Looking for winter adventure? Might as well pick a place with over 1,000 lakes. Ottertail County, Minnesota is in the middle of everywhere, offers a simpler pace, and has something for everyone. Find your inner otter at ottertaillakescountry.com. All right, welcome back. This is Sporting Journal Radio. I'm Brett Amundsen. Thank you for tuning in on this station right here on the Sporting Journal Radio Network. Maybe you're listening on demand at sportingjournalradio.com or watching this on YouTube. Thank you. Uh, Dan Amundsen and David Eckhart with us here in studio. And Joe Henry from Lake of the Woods Tourism joining us as well. Joe, we were talking about Lake of the Woods and what to use. And we've got a trip planned uh, and a glow trip plan. The Association of Great Lakes Outdoor Riders coming up at the end of the month. And we're going to be heading up there and Live Target and Smith's Consumer Products are sponsoring the event and of course we're live targets one of our sponsors here so we're gonna be using a lot of live target stuff so uh, they said well what do you want to use up there you know what what you should do so we ordered uh, some of the rattle baits uh, erratic shiner the flutter shad and the sonic shad is what we got and then we ordered some colors we got uh, uh, some gold and blacks some of that that glow white and glow gold is going to be sweet glow gold yeah i think that was probably the first one we we highlighted right there and then some some gold some glows some reds and we did some some whites and some blues just to change it up just a little bit but generally joe uh what colors are those is it, those are the colors we should have picked right those are what, that's well, I'll what, tell you what you guys, that, i i i just like danny said man that that glow gold you know yeah. and that stained water see lake, lake of the woods has that stained water and what stained water is uh, for some people i'm speaking to the choir but other people don't understand necessarily what happens is the watershed of lake of the woods everything drains from the south and goes north into the rainy river and into lake of the woods and, uh, and and other tributaries into lake of the woods well that that water is sitting amongst a lot of bog and that bog has a lot of plant matter that they naturally color or stain the water with tannins and uh, what happens is that water is kind of that light coffee color. So the good thing is the walleyes and saugers will bite all day long. The, the interesting thing with colors and noise is that, you, you know, your, your brighter colors and your golds are going to be predominant as well as using the noise because the walleye's lateral line and that inner ear they have 
So you really try to take advantage of those things in, in stained water versus if you're fishing gin clear water, you might take a little bit different strategy. So that gold glow, you know, the the, the pink UVs, um, you know, using a rattle baits like you talked about that that uh, Live Target has. But I think those are going to be winners. And that, that, you know, that flutter shed you're showing right now, you know, that in that gold red, you know, it's got that little piece of plastic on the front. And it's got a little bit of feather there on that treble hook. Sometimes it's those little things like that that'll get that walleye just interested enough to take a nip at it. And that's all you need. Well, you know, we got somebody else joining us right now. Maybe we should bring him on right now to talk about what kind of success he had up at Lake of the Woods because he was just up there. Scott Mockentune is with us too right now. How you doing, Scott? Hey, I'm doing uh, doing well. Glad to join. How was, uh, how was your Lake of the Woods experience? I had a great time. I uh, I did everything that Joe Henry told me to do, and I caught fish. Yeah. Well, what a, what a joke that is, eh? <laughs> well, hey, whatever Joe said, I did the opposite. But uh, you know, obviously Scott's a Scott's a super experienced angler in his own right. But Scott, one one of the things I thought was cool about your Lake of the Woods trip that I was really intrigued with is that you you did a family trip, and you had it was kind of neat bringing your young family plus an exchange student trip, right? I did. Yeah, we were really blessed. Uh, it was a motivation for us to get up there and do some fishing. Uh, I've always wanted to take the kids, you know, I've had conversations about doing that. And this was a great chance to plug in. You have someone that had never fished in her life before. That's our hmm. exchange student, Marissa. She's from Germany. Um, I tried to break her in on some panfish water here in southern Minnesota, uh, a little bit different than uh, than jigging for walleyes and saugers, but uh, she got the hang of it. And just having everybody up there, wow, what a what a memory that we're gonna we're gonna carry forward and definitely plan to do again. How how old is she, Scott? Uh, Marissa is fifteen, and then my two blood daughters, uh, they are eleven and about to turn seven. And she's from Germany, so obviously Germany gets cold, but had she, she'd she never ice fished before. What was her reaction when she stepped out on that big lake of the woods, that expansive sheet of ice up there? Yeah, she was pretty impressed. Uh, you know, she she live streamed uh, to, or you know, had FaceTimed with her with her parents and, she, you know, turned the phone, stepped outside and showed them, that, you know, there's Canada. <laughs> it's just nothing but fish houses and, and a great white expanse. But, you know, that's that's a really uh, amazing opportunity just to, to to get away, to have great fishing, to do something you would never otherwise do. And um, what a better way to do it than to take your family out there. Dang, those are, you've got some big fish, too. That was a big pike you caught up there. Yeah, we, we, we had a couple of great days, um, you know, pr predominantly was eating size fish, but I'm never going to complain about that. And, and you saw the diversity of, of options there. So we had a great time. We really did. I'll uh, just for the record, I want to point out that uh, all the board, I also won the board game. So it's got to be worth something. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, that's what it's about, isn't it? I mean, bringing family up there and then everybody talks about the walleyes up at Lake of the Woods. But as you, as you can see right there, Scott uh, caught that burbot, caught that big pike. There's a chance to catch a bunch of other fish while you're up there. Well, you know, I think, but, but Scott did it right too. You know, I, I think it's kind of cool because, yeah, you know, so with technology and ice fishing, there's so many more people ice fishing than ever used to because it's comfortable, it's warm, it's it's as much social as it is fishing. And and you know when you go out with a resort, I mean they take every, all the work out of it for you. You know you get up to Lake of the Woods, they tell you where the fish house is. Either they take you out or you drive yourself out to the fish house. You can come and go as you please. Usually, um, this time of the year, especially now that the ice is thick and you can drive on it with vehicles. But you know it, it they make it so easy. And you know the cool thing about Scott though is that. You know, when he did it, yeah, they, they ice fished, but they also made it fun back in the cabin. You know, they uh, they ate some good food at the at the resort in this case. They had games they wanted to play. Um, they made it. He made it somewhat social in the fish house, so that if uh, the girls wanted to take a little bit of a break from fishing, they went outside and they were you know playing outside and stuff. And you know, it, it's no different when they talk about taking kids on a boat. Let them play with the minnows. Don't stay out too long. Don't burn them out. You know, have fun. Mix it in. Make it enjoyable. And I, I just think he did a very nice job of doing that. Well, and Scott, you just did, uh, just fact, actually just a couple of minutes ago, wrapped up a webinar with the DNR on lake trout ice fishing. And I want to find out uh, how that went and uh, talk talk lake trout, man, because I love lake trout and ice fishing. So, Joe, we're going to let you go. If people want to find out more about Lake of the Woods, where should they go? You know what? Um, really, all of our information is on our website, and that is lakeofthewoodsmn.com. 
All right, more with Scott Mockentoon when we come back talking ice fishing and lake trout. Stay there. Come ice fish the famous waters of Minnesota's Lake of the Woods, the walleye capital of the world. Experience full service resorts featuring heated fish houses, ice transportation, meal plans, and sleeper house options. From the Northwest Angle to the South Shore, Rainy River, and Baudette, the Midwest's number one ice fishing destination. Walleye, Sauger, Perch, and Northern Pike, Minnesota's Lake of the Woods, best fishing anywhere. For more information, log on to lakeofthewoodsmn.com. Live Target, the leader in Match the Hatch, is back with new lures that also match the action. Introducing the Live Craw. The Live Craw is irresistible to bass, walleye, and other freshwater species. f winner, the ultimate frog, looks and acts just like a swimming frog. With an exposed ultra point mustad hook and replaceable legs, the ultimate frog has two styles, two sizes, and eight colors. And I cast an f winner, the live shrimp mimics a fleeing shrimp for saltwater anglers. Coming soon from Live Target. Ice fishing season is here. This winter, plan a trip to Devil's Lake, North Dakota. Not only will you have the chance to catch their legendary perch, but this year, Hay Bale Heights has been catching big walleye after big walleye. And they're doing it from a mobile, comfortable snow bear. No matter how cold it is outside, you're warm and toasty on the inside. Learn more and book a trip today at haybaleheights.com. That's haybaleheights.com. All right, welcome back to Sporting Journal Radio. My name is Brett Ammons, and thank you for tuning in on this station right here on the network by downloading the podcast wherever you get your favorite podcasts, or maybe you're watching this on YouTube. Thank you very much, along with Dan Amundsen and David Eckhart over there. And Scott Mockentoon is back with us once again. Uh, fisheries biologist, what's your title with the DNR, Scott? Yeah, I'm the area supervisor at the Hutchinson DNR Fisheries Office. And Hutchinson is just a hotbed for lake trout fishing. It's the number <laughs> one, number one destination. No, uh, obviously that's that's kind of your home base. But you travel travel north for for lake trout a lot. What what got you interested in lake trout, Scott? Oh man, just just wanting to do something that you don't have. Uh, you know, I think that's probably the key for a lot of folks. Is you know, this is there's 110 lakes in Minnesota that have lake trout. And we're in a state with, you know, if we're measuring lakes over 10 acres, it's 11,842, right? I mean, it's it's rare. It's one in 100 lakes have the kind of habitat that's needed for lake trout. So just such a rare opportunity, such a cool fish to catch. Yeah. And once you do fish for them and just see what an amazing predator they are, how aggressive they can be at times, how beautiful they are and how great they taste. I mean, uh, you go once and you get hooked. Oh, I see what you did there. Literally, <laughs> you know, they're man. I have in a, and in the last five six years, uh, I've just gotten more and more interested in them. Obviously, I take I take trips out, you know, up to Saskatchewan and get into the Lakers up there too. But I've done a couple of trips in northern Minnesota where we've uh, taken dog sleds lake trout fishing, and that I mean that's got to be just like the most purely min northern Minnesotan activity I think that you can come up with in the winter is taking a dog sled team for lake trout. We've done it uh, up around Ely a couple of times. Man, it, it is so much fun. And okay, so Scott, here's here's a question for you. Pound for pound, harder fighting, lake trout or smallmouth? Gosh, I, I because of the diversity of technique that I think smallmouth bass use to fight. Uh, I'm going to give it to smallies, but wow. you know, when it comes to bulldog and runs and aggressive bites, uh, which is a different question, but that's where I would classify those lake trout as just exceptional. So lake trout have uh, kind of a unique ability to kind of self-regulate as they come up out of deeper water and expel air uh, uh, as they come up. Whereas, you know, they won't suffer bear trauma like a walleye or crappie would if you're fishing them kind of deep. Do you do you tend to target lake trout in deeper water or when you're fishing them through the ice? Where do you like where do you like to set up or where do you like to target them? So, Brett, you know, you kind of led into it. We just wrapped up a, a deep in our presentation on ice fishing for lake trout and yeah. part of it is to tie what we do as biologists with what you're doing as an angler and you hit the nail on the head there where we're talking about lake trout being physostomus and that's referring to their gas bladder there's a pneumatic duct that allows them uh, to regulate that gas bladder and quickly move up and down through the water column and the beauty of doing this in the winter when you're fishing them vertically through an ice hole is you see that behavior on display 
uh, they chase that lure up and down. Um, and you know, it's one of the, one of my fishing guide friends, uh, refers to lake trout as burp sharks. Yeah. And what he's talking yeah. about is, you know, you're catching this fish that fights hard and when it's coming up, it's releasing a lot of that pneumatic duck, it's releasing air and, uh, there's that burp. So there comes all those air bubbles, but you know, answering your question and you know, I, I, and I talked about this on the presentation, we like to, I like to set up on structural elements that form something of a back stop so uh you know if i can find a rock pile a sunken island if i can get out on a point um if i can find something that a lake boat is going to uh be in the immediate area it's adjacent to deep water um but typically i'm anywhere from 20 to 60 feet and i like something rocky that they can uh you know herd those schools of ciscos or smelt up against and and feed on they're so aggressive. I think that's what makes them so much fun. They're, they're so fun. And you can see them even when they're passive, you know, and, and you're struggling to get a bite. A lot of times you can still get them to chase 60 feet, depending on how deep a water you're in. But just watching them go up and down on your electronics, chasing it back and forth, uh, it, I think is one of the more, more fun aspects to that fish. Oh, absolutely. I did t touch a little bit about we, we we wait for those really cold years as Minnesotans for that opportunity for Lake Superior to freeze over and you mm -hmm. get out there and you can be fishing 150 to 200 feet and they're coming screaming up off the bottom and, and hit her, hitting it like uh, like a linebacker hitting a running back coming across the line of scrimmage. I mean, just destroying that bait. It's it's all about paying attention. You know, you're, you you want to see those fish recognize when they're on your screen, you know, acknowledge them drop the bait see what they want if they want it aggressive or subtle take it away from them and then uh once you get hooked up man there's just nothing better i was fishing uh we were on burnt side and we were fishing i think it was about 65 feet of water in kind of the saddle and i was marking all kinds of fish down near the bottom and i don't know i think i was using a hyperglide and they would chase it and go back down and chase it and go back down. I couldn't get them to eat. I tipped it with a minnow head and they chase it up, chase it down. I switched from the minnow head to the minnow tail and I caught two fish right away. Wow. So I don't know if they were just at that point, they were just sick of seeing me, you know, bonk them on the head with it and finally decided to eat it. Or if the tail, you know, changing the tail was something a little bit different or what it was. But um, what what do you start off with? Like what kind of a presentation will you start off with when you when you target Lakers? Uh, you know, I, there's a lot in, in the bag, right? Um, there's blade baits, there's hard baits like a uh, jig and wrap or the hyperglide that you referenced. There's, uh, airplane jigs, there's tube jigs, caught a lot of them on tube jigs, uh, flutter spoons, there's heavy jigging spoons. I'm usually going to start off with a heavy rattling jigging spoon. Uh, I will have a couple rods rigged up next to me, one with an airplane jig. If I can work a fish and it's not going to commit, maybe I can drop something down. That has worked for me if they're hanging in the vicinity. They've got, you know, they can move quickly and they've got such great vision that you're never out of the game. If, if they don't take your first offering, you can drop something back down at them. And I'm typically throwing a dead bait down on the bottom, you know, running my second line that I'm authorized to do, legal to do in Minnesota. So that's that's usually my MO, but I like to play around a little bit. You know, I'll, I was even messing around with a uh, uh, with a uh, uh, glide bait, a uh, mm, I'm struggling to put my uh, <laughs> swim a swim bait. There we go. Okay. Just in, <laughs> looking like a sculpt, and you know, just fishing oh, it sure. close to the bottom. So a lot of cool stuff to throw at them. You know, we got a lot of those lakes, and I know you and I both spent a lot of time up on the Gunflint Trail. There's a there's a number of lakes up along the trail where you can you can target well not just uh, Lakers, but you know rainbows and brookies. But uh, you can target lake trout uh, along there too, can't you? You can. You know, if we're looking at distribution across Minnesota, at least, uh, you know, we have several counties across the northeastern. Uh, part of the state uh, some reclaim mine pits in mine country a lot oh, of them yeah. in st louis lake uh and cook county but for sure i mean we're looking at border waters up against the ontario border and yeah you're you're 100 right brett when you come up the gunflint trail it's really amazing how many um lake trout lakes you can access off of offshoots off the gunflint trail some are directly on uh, the Gunflint Trail, and like you mentioned too, so many places that are stocked with stream trout. So it really is quite the playground for trout fishing opportunity. That's such a cool area. I mean, that 
I have a hard time saying that that's the best area in the state of Minnesota, but it's got to be right up there. I mean, <laughs> maybe a little biased because I have used to spend a lot of time growing up up there on the Gunflint Trail, but it's such, such just so, so much history. And if you like the outdoors, it's just such a great part of the state. Oh, absolutely. Um, you did this webinar on Lake Trout today uh, for the DNR. Is that is that was that new or have you done that in the past? I mean, you've probably done some webinars in the past, but was that is that a new one for Lake Trout or is that uh, pretty common? Yeah, so just a quick plug. It's the Minnesota Outdoor Skills and Stewardship Seminar Series. It's been going on for a couple of years. Um, our outreach section, actually, we were making small talk today, and uh, the word is that uh, leadership has taken a bigger interest in it, maybe give it a little bit bigger platform to work with. Um, I gave a talk on uh, flathead and channel catfish river fishing, on pan fishing with, with your kids, and uh, now this talk on ice fishing for lake trout. But if you're into the outdoors and there's something you've wanted to try, and I think, you know, Brett, Dan, uh, David, all of us are into the outdoors in a, in a real serious way and do a little bit of everything. I consider myself a jack of all trades and a master of none. When you want to try those new things that are new to you and you don't have someone to apprentice other underneath, this is a great way. I mean, whether it's shed hunting or it's searching for morel mushrooms or it's your first white-tailed deer hunt, or whatever the topic might be or the thing is that you want to try, uh, it's a great resource. So, you know, I, I think it's all about sharing the outdoors and that's the goal of the Moss Seminar Series. And those are free and what, go about an hour or so? Yeah, that's that's correct. And the beauty of it is you register, you can see it live, but then they're also recorded uh, and captioned mm. and uploaded to YouTube. So eventually oh, nice. all that information is out there for folks to check out. Is that like, uh, is there, you know, Q&A? Could I bounce questions off you or are you just kind of presenting yeah, yeah. We, uh, I answered some questions in the middle of the talk, and then we circled back and left about 10 minutes at the end for questions. And uh, I think we hit on all of them, so it was well received. And of course, you know, we're happy to field those questions at any time. I'm more than happy to take those at, uh, at the TNR work address, email address. Gosh, you know, I think one of my favorite things about catching big lake trout, and I haven't seen this through the ice yet, uh, but when we hook into big ones in open water and it's a little bit deeper and we always, we always kind of bring the fish up a little bit slower if we're fishing deep, just to try to, we say we're waiting for the bubbles, you know, we're looking for the air bubbles to come up and there's nothing like knowing you're battling a big lake trout until you see one of the first big bubbles come up and just erupt you know, erupt from the surface. And uh, I, I just like it, your spine tingles a little bit when you see those bubbles come up. Do you, when you catch lake trout through the ice, will you get, do you see some of those bubbles coming up through the hole then? Hey, before we oh, answer, yeah. uh, we got to let our radio network go. So oh, we're out of time. The answer to this question is going to come on the podcast. So download our podcast Friday mornings if, uh, if you want to hear the answer to this question. Or uh, watch the full thing on YouTube, maybe? That's correct. All right. So uh, goodbye to the radio network uh, for the podcast and YouTube audience. Uh, we got more of Scott Mockentune coming up in just a second. Right now. Right now? Here we right. go. Hey, Scott. Hey, Scott. We're back. <laughs> and we're back. Hey. All right. So, uh, I mean, does the hole get a little violent when you're ice fishing for lake trout? It does. You know, I, I think about when I go out and sturgeon fish, this has been something that's a recent opportunity in Minnesota. Most of the anglers immediately started cutting what we call the Mickey Mouse hole. Mm -hmm. So you cut two holes and then that third hole underneath, you make the Mickey Mouse face. And that additional size of that hole is going to allow you to get that leg sturgeon up through the ice. Well, I got a great tip. You know, you pick up these little tips here and there on different things to do when you're fishing. This is one I picked up a few years ago is cut that same hole when you're lake trout fishing because, and I talked about this in the seminar, a, most fish are lost at the hole. This is an aggressive fish that doesn't tire easily. You're going to bring them up. They're still going to be green, and they're probably going to catch the end of the ice. They're going to hook one of the treble hooks. A lot can go wrong. So a couple things, use the Mickey Mouse hole and have a buddy use the buddy system it ends up being a little bit uh, of craziness when you're knocking over heaters and flashers and everything else but there's a great example use that buddy system have somebody else fetch that fish up it's not easy to do this isn't an easy fish to grip they have small scales they don't have any spines they're very slimy and powerful get a hold of them and if you want to release them you know you can't just you know grab behind the gill plate if you want to release them so you have to be careful with them too um, but but wrestle them up, get your hands underneath and splash all that water out and dump those fish up on the ice. The sooner you get them up on the ice, uh, the better. 
we caught one on that trip. We were filming for Prairie Sportsman with the sled dogs, and uh, one of the guys we were with, he did that for mine, and he had it. He was shoulder deep, and uh, and as he reached down, the the fish spit the hook. So oh. the fish was like trying to flop back down the bottom of the hole, and he just came out and just scooped that whole thing up out of the hole and got wow. up on the ice. It was, uh, it was a pretty dramatic moment uh, for ice fishing for those lake trout, but. Man, they're uh, they're such fun fish uh, to fish for and to catch, and uh, they can they can be just such uh, hard fighters. I just call them angry all the time. I think just trout in for general sure. are just angry fish, uh, whether it be Lakers. I you know one of the examples I use a lot, Scott, is the uh, the DNR fish pond at uh, the State Fair, and we used to just sit with the camera, the underwater camera on, and uh, yeah. we'd watch the fish. And you'd see muskies just kind of laying on the bottom. You'd see walleyes just like sleeping on the bottom, whatever. And trout, lake trout, rainbows, whatever, it would just be doing that <laughs> at 100 miles an hour. So I always tell people, there's the reason why I like to trout fish right there. You can see how active they are. They're a lot of fun to catch. Well um, put. I, I, wanted, I wanted to talk a, about something else. I was asking you why you weren't coming up to uh, Lake of the Woods next week, uh, the end of the month for the Aglow event. Uh, you're part of the Association of Great Lakes Outdoor Riders as well. Uh, and you can't make it because you got an archery tournament. And at first, I thought you were talking about, you know, you travel around and fling arrows and, you know, and shoot at 100 yards at a, at an, al uh, you know, a, a, dino a pterodactyl at the bottom of a hillside or something, you know. But no, you're actually coaching for NASP. Yeah, that's right. Uh, it's a wonderful program, National Archery in the Schools. Uh, it, it's the state of Minnesota and the high school league, they don't sanction it. Um, you know, a lot of outdoor sports are that we've seen sprout up in the last 10 to 15 years are trying to work their way into that, uh, uh, you know, kind of umbrella of state high school league. But as it turns out, this national archery in the schools program is just a great way to get folks out uh, and, and archery shooting. I, this is just absolutely amazing to me. I'm, I'm really blessed that, you know, my oldest daughter uh, took this up. We bought her a youth bow three or four years ago, started shooting with it. She was having fun. I think you've seen um, uh, the, the movie series that, you know, a lot of pop culture, you think about the big boom on fly fishing that came after a river runs through oh, it. Yeah. It kind of had the same effect. Hunger Games. Uh, after after the hunger games exactly mm -hmm. and so uh this has been a big push and what a great way to get your kids into an outdoor sport so um i you know i'm not going to claim any credit it all my my daughter she's out and, and practiced and gotten pretty good she did medal a number of times at uh, at least a couple of times at some tournaments nice she's a fifth grader uh, and she's still in the elementary archery program. We, we need as many coaches as you can get because you can imagine being in a gymnasium with targets and bows and field points and 50 kids lined up, you know, elbow to elbow. It's, it's pretty intense. So my wife and I signed up to coach and we're helping out and we have tournaments pretty much every weekend uh, from now through the end of March. Man, that's great. Uh, for Good. That's awesome that you're coaching. And David, you you were a part of uh, NASP in school, right? Correct. Yeah, my senior year we got it. <clears throat> that so. you oh you that was the first opportunity you had to be a part of it. Yeah. Yep. Okay. It and, was, I don't know if that's when it was new or if it was just new to our school or what, but yeah, we now, did it my senior year. Now had you? David, oh, go ahead. Scott. Real quick question, David. What was the what was the school district that uh, you shot for? Uh, Yellow Medicine East, Miami. Nice. Yep. Did you did you bow hunt before that? Or oh that, yeah. Oh, you already were. We tried to talk our coach into bringing our you know hunting bows, our Hoyts and Matthews. <laughs> you and, couldn't. No, they really? let us. They, oh, we, see, they, they, gosh, see, like in middle school, so I didn't have an official program, but it was part of our PE class. We'd shoot, and they'd be like, "Yeah, if you have your own bow, you know, you can bring your have your parent drop it off at the front office." And so <laughs> I didn't have one yet, but there'd be people in there with their you know elites or Matthews, whatever, and we're with our. PE bows and here yep. these guys with their releases just tum, 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 like uh, <laughs> I want one. <laughs> that surprises me. Nope, he wouldn't let us bring ah, him in. So weird. Did you? What was your experience like? Did you learn anything? Was it? Did you see other people taking on archery for the first time? Yeah, I saw a lot of new people within the school. You know, who were interested by it, but I didn't really know that they hunted or mm. had any interest in archery. You know, the core group of guys that I always shot with. You know, we all just signed up. 
already you know, all my high school anyway. buddies we were already interested in doing it but um yeah there was a lot of people and met a lot of people so a couple people that i met through that that i'm still friends with so nice yeah. I'll, I'll tell you what like i i played baseball and uh football and and messed around with some other sports did a lot of after school activities I don't think I don't think we had an ASP as an option when I was in school, and we definitely didn't have the Clay Target League. I think yeah, I think shotguns. I'm not sure they'd been invented yet when I was, when I was in school, but uh, no, but you could have them in your school locker. Well, yeah, no, I definitely had a shotgun in in my yeah. I definitely brought a shotgun. I, my senior pictures, I've got a shotgun in some of the pictures. Like, no, it's, yeah, it's a different time, but uh, I I would have gladly. Like, Dan, I don't know how many times I try to talk you out of uh, baseball or whatever. I can't remember what sport. Yeah, I wasn't going to happen. And said, just go go get on the Clay Target League because that's that's a sport that you're going to learn things that you're going to do the rest of your life. Like, we're not we're not world-class athletes. I hey, mean, I you watch your mouth. Any money. In I any... still had hopes and dreams. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe if my if I had an uncle that could teach me how to throw a better curveball. I, I, thought you, I taught you a pretty <laughs> dang good curveball. <laughs> well, <laughs> dropped right off the table. Yeah, I definitely good didn't get to throw it in high school. So, well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I barely did, too. So, that's, I, I, that's the thing. Like, these national archery in the schools program and Clay Target League, such great opportunities to introduce kids when people ask the question what do we need to do to get more kids into the outdoors there's two giant answers for you right there and it's and it's part of, it's part of this essentially part of the schools and it's a great way to introduce kids to the tools that that will be used in the outdoors and i, I think it's great that you're a part of it scott yeah you know we, we're lucky to have built up a really great program here um, I'm not leading by any means. There's other head coaches. There's a head coach. There's uh, level coaches for elementary, middle, and high school. It's just fun to be a part of it. It's just nice to see the kids make progress. And, you know, it, you just make small corrections and you see them get better and better. And you, you see it through the course of the year and you see it as they advance. I mean, if you come to one of our practices and you look at a target for the elementary, you're going to see, you know, some spread around that bullseye. And then as you get to the middle school, it's a little tighter. And then it's to the high school and it's tighter. It's like, man, these kids get really good in a hurry. And, and just what you said, that this is such a great introduction to the outdoors. You start looking at all their bow cases that are sitting next to the uh, to the stands. And, you know, there's stickers for, you know, fishing and hunting and getting outdoors. And it's like, hey, this is the gateway. This is, this is something for the non-athletes and it's something for folks to work on improving their skill sets, working on focusing, slowing down, you know, there's definitely real life skills that apply here to, to becoming a, a better archer, but also, uh, you know, how you, your approach to life. Absolutely. Well, uh, we'll look for that webinar on the DNR. DNR has got a YouTube channel. Yes, they do. Yep. Check okay. them out. Uh, yeah. We'll look for that lake trout and, uh, probably your past webinars will be on there then I'd, I'd assume. Yep, you should be able to find them. Um, take a look through there. Uh, we can try to spell out the name for you sometime. And uh, yeah, search for me and you'll find them. <laughs> and then uh, you wrote a, you wrote some stories about your trip up to Lake of the Woods. Where can we find uh, an article about your trip up there? Yeah, uh, the Lake of the Woods trip was on the Mankato Free Press uh, website. And uh, yeah, if you uh, look in the outdoors section, you'll find uh, columns from myself and Roy Heilman, an additional uh, Uglo member, does a yeah, nice I read, job, so we'll pluck for him. And I read Roy's, too. It sounds like he's had a little bit of a str struggle this winter. <laughs> it's been tough. We've got a lot of <laughs> snow. Uh, but if if nothing else, I enjoy uh, Roy for his humor and typically uh, self-deprecation. Absolutely. All right. Well, uh, well Scott, uh, Mock and Tune, thank you for the time today. Uh, keep up all the good work, and uh, we'll send you pictures from Lake of the Woods while we're up there. I appreciate that. I'll try to do the same. Uh, thanks, everybody, for listening, and uh, good luck fishing. Yeah, good luck on opener, Scott. You bet. All right. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, David. And thank you for listening slash watching. Uh, we'll see you next week. Sporting Journal Radio is a division of Macaba LLC. If you've got a question, comment, or story idea for us, send us an email. Go to SportingJournalRadio.com. While you're there, you can learn how to advertise on the show and visit our store for hats, hoodies, coffee mugs, and more. Go to SportingJournalRadio.com.